We're going to be going deep. Is that okay? Yeah. And I'm going to be teaching you guys some principles which truly transform my life, and I, I hope they transform yours as well. And here's uh, two scriptures that I want to use to set the context for that. The first is Jeremiah 6.16. If you don't mind, could you stand up with me and let us read the word together? I don't do this because it's an orthodox uh, uh, principle that I have. I do this because the word of God is honorable. We stand up for the things of, that we honor and value like brides. Come on, somebody. And um, here's what I want us to do. I want us to read it together because I believe this is what we'll be doing in heaven, right? Co community and common ground is what we're going to be doing. So Jeremiah 6, verse 16, at the count of three, let's read it together. One, two, three, let's go. Thus says the Lord, stand by the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they said, we will not walk in it. Here's another one, Proverbs 29, verse 18. At the count of three, read it with your boy. Ready? One, two, three, let's go. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint, but blessed is he who keeps the law. Let's pray. Father, we just come before you. Knowing that we are not worthy, it is the sacrifice of your son. It is the love of the Father and is the intentionality of the Holy Spirit that we stand before you. Called saints regardless of the things that we have done. And so we thank you for the blood of Jesus. Lord, I just come before you and I just invite the Holy Spirit into this place. Because he was given to us as a gift of the teacher. So we say, teacher, teach. If you don't mind, can you just say with me, can you say, come Holy Spirit? Let's just say it one more time. Say, come Holy Spirit. And so Father, listen to the cries of your people and send the Holy Spirit, the manifest presence of God in this place. Because when the Holy Spirit comes, then nothing else matters. And if it doesn't come, then no nothing else matters. So come, Holy Spirit, teach us, convict us, and convince us. You are the CEO of this meeting and this conversation, so speak through the oracles. Find expression through these lips of clay. I ask and I thank you in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Hey, high five the person next to you and say, let's roll. And you may be seated. Where there is no prophetic vision, the people cast off restraint. But blessed is he who keeps the law. Jeremiah 6, 16, thus says the Lord, stand at the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good way is and walk in it and find rest for your souls. But they say we will not walk in it. Uh, I use this, this conversation, this scripture to frame the dynamic of people that I, I want to speak to. But before we can understand the deeper life in the kingdom and walking with the Father, we need to understand the intentionality of God's desire and his design. We need to understand that God is a master creative and God is a master engineer and that everything that God creates has a specific purpose. That when God spoke things into existence, he spoke fully functional ecosystems and systems which have never broken down or needed maintenance because he is a whole being and out of the essence of who he is, he creates. So in Genesis 1 verse 26, he says, let us make man in our image and according 
according to our likeness. And when you ask theologians, right, to give an expressive picture, to paint a picture of the dynamic of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, the Godhead, they say they are what you call the perichoresis. Peri, where you get the word perimeter around, and choreo, which is call and answer, where you get the word choreography. So when they were asked to determine and explain the relational dynamic between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, one of the church fathers, St. Gregory of Nazianzus, who was an incredible orator and communicator in his day and age, says, if you were to stand and get a macro perspective of the relational dynamic of the Father, it's almost like they're embroiled in a dance. And what he said was, it is a dance of deference. It is a dance of honor. It is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And when you read every account Jesus gives of the Father or the revelation of the Holy Spirit and the Father sending the Holy Spirit, you see this dance. And out of this intricate and beautiful and creative dance, they then create the universe. And when you look at everything in its most natural form, when you look at smoke ascending, when you look at the the waves, when you look at the leaves in the wind, you see the dance of eternity echoed and mimicked in all of creation because as the creation is, it is in the image of the creator. He created good things because he is good. Then he creates us in his image and as long as we are uh, connected with his goodness, we then create good things. In the same way, the basic makeup of man, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, is what we are. We are tripartite or three-part beings. Uh, we are uh, a spirit, we are soul, and we are body. Come on. The body is this melanin magnificence that you guys see in front of y'all. Come on, this earth suit, that which is the vehicle, and uh, uh, the, 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 the modality of which we interact with the world around us. The soul is the center of your self-consciousness, right? Your mind, your will, your emotion, your personality, and all of those. And the spirit is that part which comes from God and connects with God. In the book of Genesis, it says, and God breathed his spirit into this heap of clay, and man became a living being. We are eternal beings because he is eternal. That's why when people die, they don't really stay in that particular thing. Their body remains, but their spirit goes to God. And it's very important for us to understand this as we go back into the context of what we're talking about, because here's what it says. It says, stand by the crossroads and look and ask for the ancient paths where the good ways and walk in it and find a rest for your souls. What is the soul? Mind, come on, talk to me. Will, emotions, your self-consciousness, your personality. And how many of you guys know that everything about the kingdom of darkness and everything about the generation and the eon that we exist in is an assault and an affront on your very soul? How many of you guys know that it is exhausting to live a normal life in this day and age? So I'm speaking to a people that understand, called to dwell in a city that knows no rest. And what it is, is in every generation, there is an assault on your souls. And whenever that happens, we do it as humans because we were, in, we were, we, we, we were extricated from a God of identity who was our source of peace and love and all things good. And because of that, then we raise up gods in our own images to sell medicate and that is essentially where binge watching and and drugs and sexual addiction come from because we're trying to fill a void that we have and whenever we run to those gods which are made in our own image instead of giving unto us they take from us and they leave us in a state of weariness so i am talking to a generation that has cast off restraint and i'm saying hey there is an antidote in jeremiah 6:16 6, and it says whenever you have found no rest for your souls you have to go back to the crossroads where everything is screaming at you and look for the ancient paths because when you find the ancient paths and the practices that he set in place before time immemorial, then you will find rest for your mind, your will, your emotions, and healthy expressions of your personality. 
So whenever you exist in a situation or whenever you find yourself in a space where you can find no internal rest, the Bible says all you need to do is to go back to the ancient paths and say, hey, where is the good way? And when you find that good way and you begin to walk in that good way, then you will find rest for your souls. So what is the ancient paths? I think if we can go as ancient as we want, and it goes to the book of Genesis, Genesis 1, 26. So at God and the council of the God had begun to create all these things, and they go, Dr. Strange, he speaks to this, and all these things are coming up, and he's going inception on everything, and he creates this perfect world, but it's missing something and in Genesis 1, 26. Say, let us make man in our image according to our likeness, and let them have dominion. And the Bible says in the cool of the day, God would come to visit Adam, and they had unbroken and unbridled communion. So God's design was to create a being of communion to commune with him. So in its very form, man was made to contact or commune with God. Man was made to contain God, and man was then meant to convey God. Those are the primary functions of men. You were made to communicate. You were made to contact God. You were made to contain God. And then you were made to convey God. And what happens is, uh, are you guys still with me? And then what happens is, obviously, you know, it's what happens every time you force a man to eat a salad. Everything goes sideways. Come on, somebody. Right? And the one thing that man then loses is the ability to contact God, the ability to contain God. But he still had within himself the mandate to convey God. And if you're as sharp as I know you are, you can literally look at the different faculties, spirit, soul, and body, and see which of those has a specific function. But God, because he exists outside of time, the Bible in the book of Revelation says, hey, the lamb was slain before the foundations of the earth, which means before you develop the capacity to sin against him, there was already an atoning sacrifice. So that means before anything was created, the first thing that was there was an altar and a lamb sacrificed on it. And what an altar is, an altar is a technology that allows us to contact God once more so that when that thing was broken, there was an altar. So sacrifices are as ancient as the ancient of days, and they predate our ability to break our communion and our connection with God. So when man lost this, the first thing that he gave is an altar. That's why as you go into Genesis 4, it talks about this, this broken communion. Then Adam and Eve essentially have another son called Seth. And Seth gives birth to a son called Enos. And right there it says, and man began to call on the name of the Lord. And whenever from, literally from the book of Genesis, for when there's that broken thing, up until the book of Revelation, you see altars upon altars upon altars, until they comes right in in there when, uh, when God is essentially speaking to Moses and, and, and he's speaking to all those people, he's like, hey, I want your people to build me a tabernacle that I may dwell in their midst. And right there, he institutes the tabernacle. And when you look at the tabernacle, the tabernacle was a self-contained unit because on the front end was where you would wash all of the sin. And then there was an altar to get rid of the very nature of sin. And then there was a holy of holies. And self-contained within that was the technology to bring man into a space to where he can contact, to where he can contain, and he can convey God. So the ancient past that I really want to go into is the simple fact that everything about life and existence and the universe that we know about it responds to sacrifice. So I'm going to talk to you about two things today, prayer and fasting. Because see, back then, remember they had the altar and the tabernacle and all of those, but Jesus, by his blood, comes into a space to where he goes into the Holy of Holies, he sprinkles his blood right on the mercy seat once and for all, and now we can come boldly as long as 
We acknowledge the blood of Jesus as the eternal sacrifice. So now there is no need for us to go to specific places and uh, uh, literally sac sacrifice on altars so we can communicate with God. And there is none of that. So, But what there is now, there is modalities and things that he gave to us as a gift so we can communicate with him and so that we can then take whatever he says and convey it to the world around us because the primary method way that he created us is as kings and priests. You see this from the book of Genesis all the way to the book of Revelation. And we see this modeled in the nation of Israel to where the Bible says they would come in and go out. So their kings would lead them into the presence of the Lord and they would find the priests in there would then consult God on their behalf and give them divine strategies. Then the kings would turn around and lead them out into their mandate to conquer the world. And Jesus comes, and after the order of Melchizedek, he turns around and he says, hey, I am making you a kingdom of kings and priests. That is why he's worth in the book of Revelation. So this is an Old Testament. This is pre-Old Testament. This is outside the parameters of time. And your responsibility and your call is to essentially be a priest to where you can come into the presence of God, covered by the blood of Jesus, which brings us into right alignment. And when you're there, get the strategies for your marriage, for your school, for the people around you, and then you step out and do what we lost in the, in the Garden of Eden, which is take dominion and expand his kingdom. Is this, Hayden, is this okay, or should I slow down, or should I dumb it down, like should I... Right? Okay. I'm trying to kind of lay uh, a giant foundation in like the five African minutes that I was given so we can kind of go deep. So I wanted you to understand the ancient paths, that prayer and fasting that you guys, the journey that you have been going on is a journey of sacrifice and is a journey necessary to commune with God. And that if you can incorporate these practices into your everyday life, it's not just like, hey, every once in a while, you know, I'll dabble with the deep things of God. No, once I, like I said, you are meant to live in the depths of Christ and then step out and manifest him to a generation that is in dire need of who he is. So I'm going to take us to our first context uh, real quick. Uh, Matthew 17, verse 14 to 21, and here's the story. It says, And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. As a father, right, my heart rends in empathy because as a parent, there's nothing worse than seeing your children suffer. As a matter of fact, I know that every single parent in the world, even me as selfish as I was until I held my son in my arms and I was like, dang it, I would die for this little thing. And it's never thanked me a single day of its life. Come on, somebody. But there's something deep inside me which was deeply imprinted by the God of my design, which is a desire to sacrifice ourselves for the things without we love. Why is that? The Bible says, for God so loved that he gave. That was his nature. Then he created us in his image. Therefore, whenever we love, we give. I don't care how stingy you are. You guys know people who are stingy as all get out until they fell in love. Then all of a sudden they make it rain. Come on, somebody. It could even be the most toxic relationship ever, but I can take your, your, your credit card statement and tell you what you love because your money will always go to it. Hello, Cowboys merch, and I'm guilty. <laughs> toxic relationship, but every year, like an idiot, I'm making it rain. Why? Because when you love, the expression of that is giving. Where do we get that? We get that because we're divine imprints of our Father. Kind after kind, cause and effect, and the effect will always mirror the cause, and we are the effect of what that essentially looks like, right? And so this father is coming in a state of hopelessness because his son has suffered severely, and this thing that has gotten a hold of him is not interested in his preservation because it sometimes throws him in the fire and into the water. And do you know what's worse than us being thrown into the fire and the water? It's watching the people that we love day in and day out be subject to things that we know are destructive to them. 
And so he comes to Jesus and the disciples, and he was like, hey, I heard you guys have been walking around town, raising dead people, turning water into wine, multiplying bread and fish fries. You guys have got to be the real deal. Come on, somebody. Can you heal my son? But the disciples could not cure him. And I want to say, speak to you that unless we get the reason that I'm here today communicating is we have to get the secret source of the divine power of God. Otherwise, there is a but an entire hungry generation, an entire city that keeps coming to knock on the house of bread and we have nothing to give them because we have not gone to the source. So many people out there are saying, I went to the church because I heard there was the answer. When I got there, it was clickbait because there was not love to be seen in the house. There was not healing to be seen in the house. There was not deliverance to be seen in the house. And, and, and without praxis, without a practical expression, without, without proof of what we're called to do, listen, all of this is, it's philosophy. And it's bad philosophy at that. Because it starts with a talking snake and it's all of these things. If you try to engage this from the realm of the mind, every other religion out there which was created by man will be more rational than yours. That's why when Jesus came, he said, hey, don't listen to any of the prophets and everything. Hey, listen to me. Watch the works that I do. That's why I say, hey, such as I have, right? When, when, when Peter and John went to pray, they were like, hey, we don't have silver and gold, but what we have, receive of what we have. And oh, Lord, for a generation that's like, hey, we don't have honor. We don't have followers. We don't have Bitcoin. We don't have whatever you value. But such as we have out of the fullness of what we have, out of the nature of restoration that we've been given, out of the mandate to convey God to a dying generation, receive. And the moment we do that, we won't need as much donuts. Come on, somebody. Even though I love me some donuts. Come on, somebody. We won't need as much coffee because the human beings created from the very source of all power is inextricably drawn to any and every source of power like moth to a flame. And that's why this entire generation is allured by witchcraft and magic because it's an inferior source of power, but at least it's not an, an, an apologetic source of power. 20% of power is more powerful than a 100% source running at 5%. We owe this generation a representation and a conveyance of God. Listen. And then it says, then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. That's good news. Come on. When Jesus is like, yo, bring him to me. You know it's about to go down. Come on, somebody, right? <laughs> and it says, and Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him, and the child was cured from that very hour. We're about to go deep in this. Then the disciples came to Jesus privately, because smart people, right? And they're like, why could we not cast it out? So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, listen to this, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here and to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. Y'all, that's in red letters. That means there's no cap. Come on, somebody. Come on, right? However, say however. however. That means there's a clause. This kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. I want to dwell on that lofty premise that if Jesus said nothing can be impossible to us, listen, the word, the truth hangs on a very fickle premise. Trust hangs on a very fickle premise, which is if someone violates your trust, at a fundamental level, you have reason for skepticism and to question everything else about them. So for a being to build an entire system of worship on integrity, it must mean that everything that comes out of their mouth is provable and rational truth. So which means either Jesus means all of it or he means none of it. When he says that impos nothing shall be impossible to you, either he means that or he's exaggerating, which means then we can question, what about my salvation? 
But what I love about this is that the truth of God is absolute. And we can believe it. So if Jesus says nothing will be impossible to you, he truly means it. And if there are impossibilities in our life, then is it possible that it is not the source, but the vessel that is compromised? You read the book of Acts, and you see these people walking every single day like an episode of Marvel or Heroes or whatever it is you watch where you get your superhero fix, and it's their daily lives. They're getting bitten by snakes. They're raising dead people. You know what I'm saying? Like, it's like crazy things. Jesus is walking on water, walking through holes, like insane things. The impossibility, the impossible and the possible, finding perfect harmony in this son of God's expression of himself. And then he turns around and he doesn't just say nothing shall be impossible to us. Oh no. He goes even further and he says, hey, and all the things that I have done, greater works than these will you do because I go to the Father. So either we believe all of it or we believe none of it, but the world is not giving us a pass for powerlessness because encoded deep into them is a desire to see things restored to their original nature. Not in heaven, but here, because Romans 8 talks about that all of creation was subjected to frailty in hope because they would find their freedom in the perfect liberty of the sons of God. What that means is, have you ever been to, here I go with parties again, but it's Vegas, sure, let's go with it. Have you ever been to a party and everybody's a wallflower and it's kind of lame until somebody comes in that's an Enneagram 7 and they have no regard for their coolness whatsoever and they go right into the middle of the dance floor and they start to express the freedom of who they are as a son of dance and before you know it, everybody is drawn to the gravity of their sonship and their freedom. Why? Because we were made and all of creation was made to move to the tune of a harmony. Entropy. The entire world is going one way. And the only antidote is when sons step into the fullness of their identity. This is what happens when there is a crazy storm and Jesus is sleeping and they wake him up and write, mid-nap. You know, that is the most unspiritual you are when you wake up for a nap, right? He wakes up for a nap and he wakes up like swinging. That's what he says. He's like, Are you faithless? You know what I'm saying? Faithless generation. Where's your faith? And then he says, He rebukes the storm. What happened out of the calm and the peace of who, we, who he was, which is more infinite than the chaos around him? He rebukes the storm and he brings it to peace. That's an example of what it looks like when sons manifest the peace that's on the inside of them and creation finds freedom in the glorious liberty of sons. Then he turns around and gives us this same mandate. And he says, hey, nothing will be impossible. You will do greater works. Listen, I promise you I've never been to heaven, but I promise you that there is a conversation that will happen when you step into heaven. And the people that Hebrews 11 talks about who died, I mean, they subdued nations. They do all of this. Hebrews 11 talks about a hall of faith and fame and all those people that did incredible things. But the Bible says they had an, 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 an inferior software because because God had something better for us. And now they exist as a, 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 a cloud of witnesses peering over the balcony of heaven, looking at earth season 2024 to see if you're going to do a little something, something. You know what I'm saying? And I promise you when we stand before them, they'll be like, hey, the same glory that used to reside on the ark, the same glory that killed Uzzah, the same God, the Kabod, the weightiness, dwelled inside of you. What songs did you write with it? What did you create with it? What movements did you do with it? You're like, you got to understand. I sent a lot of tweets back in the day. You know what I'm saying? I, uh, no. We have a legacy of the impossible. And we have an open invitation. And before he went out there, he made sure the way was wide open and there was no obstacle that could keep us from there. And on top of that, he sent us a teacher, not just to dwell with us, but in us, to whisper how to walk in this pathway. What witness are we taking to a generation that's out there? And so here it is. Nothing shall be impossible 
to you. However, everybody say however. however. He says, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. This kind of what? All right, we're back in school. This kind of what? No, no, come on. Don't be shy. Come on. What my teacher used to say, there's no such thing as a stupid uh, a question or a stupid answer. There's only stupid people asking questions and giving answers. I'm kidding, right? <laughs> no, I'm kidding. It's, it's a conversation, right? It's a communication. Hey, um, he says, nothing will be impossible for you. Talk to me. However, this kind does not go out except through prayer and fasting. This kind of what? Shout it out. There's no wrong answer, I promise. You know what I'm saying? There's some people saying power and there's some people saying demon. I was raised... Because I came from a Pentecostal background to think that the kind there is talking about a demon because what they failed to cast out was a demon. And this theology is wrong and very dangerous because if you do this, there's two things. There's prayer and fasting and kind. So as long as you think that there's a kind of demon that can only be cast out by prayer and fasting, then you will take the grace of God and turn it into a machine for works. And you'll be like, the more I pray and the more I fast, then I become more powerful and it becomes another episode of Dragon Ball Z. Come on, somebody. <laughs> right? It's going to mean that when you haven't done it, then you can't walk in freedom because you'll be like, what did I do? Maybe I didn't pray enough and do this. And it becomes religion when it was meant to be relationship. So the modality for the access to this power is prayer and fasting. We're about to jump into why. But first of all, we need to establish what this kind is. So they came to him with a demon problem. You guys are here with me? Let me teach for, for a little bit. They came and they say, there's this demon and he's trying to take out my son. Disciples cast this demon out. They fail. Then they come to him and Jesus cast it out. And then they come back and say, why couldn't we cast it out? He says, because of what? Your unbelief. Because, because of unbelief. And then he goes on to say, I tell you that with this, this, you can say to this, move and will, nothing will be impossible with you. However, this kind does not go out except through prayer and fasting. This kind of what? Exactly. See, the problem wasn't the demon. The problem was their unbelief. And what he's saying, and we understand this, that faith is the currency to get everything and anything that we want from the kingdom. Everybody knows this. There's scripture upon scripture that I won't get into it. And so he says, hey, the Bible, whatever you believe is touching and everything, you can receive all of that. So when we walk in faith and whatever we're praying for is in alignment with the will of God, then the impossible truly becomes nothing. And the reason we don't see specific things is because there is a compromise to the caliber of our faith. Wow. So it's not a demon problem. It's not an addiction problem. It's not a sickness problem. It's not a Netflix and chill problem. It's not a binge problem. It's an unbelief problem. That's why they couldn't cast it out, right? And it says this type does not go out except through prayer and fasting. So you have a legacy of the impossible, and the only thing standing in the way of you walking out that legacy of the impossible is your unbelief. Now here's the thing. Unbelief is very different from doubt. Those are two separate things. Uh, the, the, the opposite of faith is not doubt. It's unbelief. What is unbelief? Unbelief is a specific type of faith. And here's what I mean by that. See, unbelief is a faith that that thing will definitely not happen. So doubt is like, you know what? I don't believe that will happen, right? Unbelief says, I know for a fact it is not going to happen. So it's a faith that is antithetical to the result that you seek. And the Bible says that is the type of faith which then stops you from getting things. And the only way to get rid of unbelief or that type of faith is through prayer and fasting. Let me try to close this. Let me try to break a world record and close this in five minutes. Right? Prayer and fasting. Why is this? See, remember we say it's spirit, soul, and body, right? Spirit, soul, and body, that's how we're made up. Think about it this way. In the body, right, the main faculties for interaction with the world around us are senses, right? Touch, taste, sight, all five of them. You guys know them, right? What are they? Are they inputs or outputs? 
inputs, right? Eyes, light, you know, spritz, smell, and all of those kinds of things. Now, here's what's interesting about the body, right? You have to align the right stimulus to the right faculty. You see what I'm saying? For you to get something. So if you take a fragrance and you spray it close to my nose, you see what I'm saying? I smell it. Now, if you take a fragrance and spray it into my eye, one is an input and one is the stimulus, but there is, you see what I'm saying? Yeah. Or if you scream into my ear, hey, we got power. If you scream into my eye, there's nothing. So there's nothing wrong with the stimuli and there's nothing wrong with the faculty. They're just misaligned. In the same way, we have to understand that in the spirit, there are also faculties and there's different stimulus. You can study this, but when it comes to prayer, every single time the Bible talks about prayer, it talks about the spirit. My spirit prays every time. You will never see prayer aligned with the soul. Because it's not the soul that prays, it's the spirit that prays. Why is that? Because the spirit, because prayer is a modality of communication and communion. So we come from the Father, therefore we speak his language, and that's what prayer is. That's why it's spirit to spirit, because we're God, spirit beings. That's why Jesus says God is a spirit, yeah. right? If you don't mind, can we get uh, maybe someone on the pads with me and everything? But every time the Bible mentions fasting, the corresponding faculty for fasting is the soul. And every time you look at fasting, then there are scriptures here, and uh, we won't really get into them. But every time it talks about fasting, it says, hey, when I humbled my soul with fasting. So it speaks to two words, actually, humbled and soul. So what is the soul? It's the center of your self-consciousness, right? It is the amalgam of your belief systems, your value systems. It's where you have rational thought about what's possible and what's impossible. So if I come and I bring you somebody that's sick and I say pray for them, you don't believe it's going to happen because you have rational evidence. You can see their legs you can see how you know how long they've been in that position. So then your faith goes to unbelief and you know that for a fact, I cannot do this because it's impossible. What just happened? Your mind, your will, and your emotions bonded together to craft a framework of unbelief. Which then means when you pray, your prayer is not a prayer of faith. And we know that it is the prayer of faith, come on James, that makes sick people well. So what happens based on that scripture where David says, I humbled my soul with fasting, Psalms 35 verse 13, thank you so much back there, is all about ascendance and subservience. When your spirit is in a space of ascendance, it communicates with God and there's no impossibility in the convictions of your spirit because it comes from a realm of the impossible. But most of the time, we see sick people and we've heard stories of dead people and we've paid attention in science and maybe some of us are doctors. So this particular thing, our mind, our will, our emotions, our rational thought, our cognition speaks to the fact that it's impossible and our soul comes into a place of ascendance and our spirit is in a place of subservience. And now you're a double-minded man and James says you can never get anything from him. But when you fast, what it does is it humbles your soul and it brings it into a place of subservience to where your spirit can then be in a place of dominance. And when you pray things, and when you declare things, there is nothing standing in between and heaven responds to the language of faith. So as we come into this place, I just want to say the fasting that you've gone through isn't just a physical exercise. It's not just a soulish exercise. It is, fasting is prep work. Fasting is running interference. And when it's not coupled with prayer, it was just a benefit to your body, but it has no spiritual significance at all. I'm here to call you as a generation called to do the impossible back into the spaces and places of power where you ask God 
for the impossible. Will you go to war on behalf of your children, on behalf of your families, on behalf of your generation, on behalf of... Because here's the thing. Jesus, when he went up there, God gave the earth to us. We are in charge here. We are in charge. So when we rise up and we say, Lord, move on behalf of my family, move on behalf of my school. I won't let the enemy take my generation. When you do all of those, heaven responds to that. And so does the kingdom of darkness. So if you don't mind, and if you're comfortable with it, uh, can we get the worship team up here? Um, there's a scripture in Zechariah 12, verse 10. This is going to be the premise uh, that I want us to go into this next part. And here's what it says. Then I'll pour out on the house of David and on the people of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and prayer. A spirit of grace and prayer. See, prayer is a discipline. It's unnatural to who we are. And our soul and our body fights it because it comes against the God of distraction that we serve in this particular generation. So it takes the grace of God to empower you to where you can make it a discipline because it's through prayer that you interface with heaven and you convey God to a generation. So the prayer that we're about to pray is very simple. It's for God to pour out a spirit of grace. What is grace? It's divine empowerment for something. Spirit of grace and prayer that we step out of this as beings of the deep that move in this space. If you don't mind, or if you're able, could you just stand up with me? And we're just going to make this a holy moment. I'm just going to say a quick prayer. And then I just want you to stay in a space for about a minute or two and speak to your father. Then I'd love for you guys to kind of lead us back into that a holy song, or whatever you want to do with it. I'll be done with this. But the last thing that I say is uh, 1 John 5, verse 14 to 15. It says this is the confidence that we have in approaching God. That if we ask for anything according to his will, he hears us. And if we know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we have asked of him. The strategy of prayer is agreement and alignment. The Bible says, again, I say, if two of you agree on earth concerning anything they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. So you find somebody to agree with you, which is agreement. Then you make sure that what you're asking is an alignment with his will. And when you do that, then you bombard the throne of grace on behalf of the things which are bothering you. And the Bible and testimony and the generations are full of stories of how heaven responded to a praying mother, a praying father, a praying friend, a praying we have access to go. We never have to accept things at face value. The Bible calls it importunity. So never take a no from somebody that cannot give you a yes. What I mean is just a very, a very logical, logical, logical analogy. When you go somewhere and maybe you want to talk to Elon Musk or whoever, and he's on the 56th floor, that means there's 55 floors. You're like, Elon Musk, I need a billion do dollars for a surgery. I need something from you, right? Only Elon Musk can give you that yes, right? But there are 55 levels of people that are paid to give you no, even if they don't have the authority to give you the yes. So, so many times when we're contending for someone or contending for something, we take no from doctors and we take no from situations and we take no from common sense and we take no from our emotions when those things do not have the authority to give us a yes. So I'm speaking to somebody here that whenever you're in a situation and you need God to move in your life, you have free access to go into that. Go into a place of fasting to where all your emotions are in a place of subservience and your spirit is in a place of ascendance and ask boldly. And when you do, those things will happen. So if you don't mind, can we just hold our, our, our hands out in front of us in a posture, universal posture of surrender. And here's what I'd love for us to just do. Just speak to your Father right now and ask for the grace, first of all, to return to the ancient paths. Because I know there are people in this room right now that your souls are not at rest. The moment you walk out of those doors, that situation is still waiting for you. And then in this particular moment, I just want you to go, Father, it's got to be me. It's got to be me. I've asked pastors to pray for me, but and they've prayed with the best of intentions, but it hasn't changed because it's got to be me. 
And so give me the grace for prayer. Give me the grace for fasting. Give me the grace to live a deep life. And from that space to manifest the kingdom for your glory and for your honor. So just speak to him right now and just take it. A few seconds to ask him. The Bible says, hey, he desires to give us good gifts. His spirit is here to pour himself out and give us good gifts. So come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Holy Spirit. Come, Holy Spirit. Empower your people for a life of prayer, a life of the impossible. A life of fasting, oh God. Do it, Father. Just go ahead and speak to the Father right now. And for some of us, it may be giving things up. For some of us, it's laying down our lives. Whatever it is, the Holy Spirit is in that moment, in that space with you, and is giving you instructions. But don't walk out of those doors without the grace for a lifestyle of prayer and fasting and the impossible. It's your birthright. It is your birthright. And your generation demands it of you. So do it for us, Father. Just keep praying right now as they lead us back into a space of worship. And don't move from that space until the Lord has met you in that place. <laughs> 